Hey, how's it going? If this is your first time on this channel, I'd actually like to point out that this is part two of a three-part video series on Bill Nye the Science Guy. Last time we covered the context behind Bill himself, including his background and his qualifications. This particular video is an in-depth analysis of what made his Science Guy PBS show so iconic and effective. This is necessary if I have any hope of trying to untangle what the hell went wrong with his Netflix show. But that's the next video. I don't hate my life quite enough to attempt to write that one right now. I wasn't born until halfway through the PBS show's original run, so it should be pretty obvious that I never once saw the show live. I don't think I know anyone who actually saw an episode live. No, the first time I ever saw a Bill Nye episode had to be somewhere in the year like 2008, 2009 when I was in grade 7. And that last bit is important because we exclusively watched Bill Nye as a learning supplement in middle and high school. The Science Guy show managed to remain relevant for an impressively long period of time for a few key reasons. Firstly, it's the classic get out of jail free card for teachers, and especially substitute teachers. You have over 100 different topics from almost all fields of science, technology, and a little bit of mathematics, all condensed into 20 to 25 minute episodes. Students get a good overview, Bill is almost certainly five times more excited to teach than the teacher is, and also means that there's no need to plan an actual lesson. Just Google any episode title and add the word worksheet to the end and boom, you've got your lecture notes for the day. Secondly, the modern day consensus on the topics covered is practically guaranteed to be the same as it was 20, 30, or even 50 years ago. But there are exceptions! We have gravity pretty well figured out by now, or at least I hope most of us do. Now that's not to say we aren't learning new things all the time about well understood fields. In fact, gravitational waves were proven to exist only just last year. But we're talking about a middle to high school level understanding of a topic here, not quantum mechanics or artificial intelligence. The show never gets that technical or specific, so most episodes are just as accurate in 2017 as they were in 93. Areas of research that are less than 50 years old are the closest exception to this rule since they progressed dramatically in the short time since the show aired. That's true for any young field, but those are few and far between. Admittedly, there have been a few noteworthy changes in school curriculums in areas such as computer programming now that computers are more accessible than ever, but even then the Science Guy episode on computers is still very relevant since it tackles a lot of fundamentals such as binary, data storage, and instruction lists. And lastly, the show manages to cling to relevancy even after 20 years because it almost transcends generational appeal, and remains just as entertaining now as when it first aired back in the 90s. Now obviously I'm not trying to say that everyone ever thinks Bill Another Science Guy is a fantastic show because that would be dumb. It's a quirky kids science show. Rather, my argument is that it managed to age extremely well, despite obviously being born in the 90s, it didn't die with the 90s. There was a significant subset of media from that decade that may, just maybe, have taken itself a little bit too seriously. Boy bands, post Bill and Ted Keanu Reeves films, every anime ever based on a toy line, they all look goofy as fuck these days. But you want to know why rewatching this show doesn't induce that same feeling of retroactive cringe? It's because Bill already knew that he was goofy back then. He was not trying to hide it. Trust me, he knew. That earnestness and enthusiasm is what separated his show from a generation that was obsessed with wanting to be taken seriously. A generation that was too cool for school. Science is neat, science is engaging, and science can be cool. But oftentimes many of us confuse cool with showing excitement about something is lame. If you're super into something, don't be afraid of showing it. The genuine passion for science that is embedded in the show was and still is critical to its success. So hopefully I've managed to clear up why the Science Guy show is still kicking around, but none of those reasons would really matter if the show wasn't a superb teaching tool. If I had to outline it, there are five key elements that I view as essential for crafting the perfect lesson. It must be engaging, precise, applicable, relatable, and effective. And it does this through delivery, language, examples, analogies, and emphasis. To be clear, these are not some sort of agreed upon set of academic principles that I looked up or researched or anything like that. Forgive me if I sound like I'm talking out of my ass, but these are components that I always look for in learning material because I find them helpful for teaching me. You might view learning differently than I do, this is just how I conceptualize it, so feel free to disagree. Pretty straightforward stuff, I hope, but I'll be elaborating on each individually in a little bit. I'm gonna be talking about examples by giving examples of someone else giving examples, almost offensively meta. But to start things off though, I'm gonna explain what I mean by engaging delivery which is a pretty direct continuation of the point I was discussing earlier. In other words, how the Science Guy show presents what should be the driest of the dry through the lens of entertainment. If you don't even have someone's interest, good luck trying to get their understanding. Engaging delivery is certainly the most distinct of the five elements I have listed because, whereas the remaining four are techniques used to instruct a student, engaging delivery is the style in which you utilize these approaches. You can deliver the same example in dozens of ways, either through tone of voice, physical gestures, props, demonstrations, jokes, and so on. The example itself wouldn't change, but a student's reception to it would. In the context of a TV show, engaging delivery relates to every facet of its artistic style. The jokes, the set, the music, the segment structure, and even the editing. Everything that would elevate a normal classroom lesson into a performance, whose goal is to entertain as much as inform. So what do we know so far? Bill is an enthusiastic, goofy, but genuine presenter whose best work is carefully scripted and recorded. He has an appealing voice that is ideal for communicating technical subjects in an approachable manner, and he's well versed in the subjects he's covering. That's the bottom line, of course. You don't need to know much more than that to understand my arguments, but if you want a refresher, feel free to check out the previous video where we covered all that. Now the first thing you've got to think about when producing a show is whether the show's writing and format lend itself to the host's strengths. Bill already has the academic background, 
background, so that area should be covered, and we know that the show is pre-recorded, so we'll be able to take as many takes as he wants to perfect the delivery. But how do you gear the presentation format to his characteristic almost out of breath speaking style? The answer is to never once let up on the breakneck pace of an episode. Quick line deliveries, snappy transitions, loud sound effects, and hammering home a point until it's stamped into the viewer's brain. The name of the game here is getting so in your face that you have no other choice but to pay attention. When a concept needs a little time to sink in, the show will slow down and let you breathe, but it won't be long until the next cutaway gag comes along and ratchets back up the pacing. Every part of the lesson is significant, every little tidbit of information is the most wild thing Bill has ever heard, and that excitement is gradually transferred to the viewer. The other essential ingredient here is the tone. What do you notice that truly sets these two clips with almost the exact same technical information apart from one another? Now, the solar system together is electrical. The electrons, which are negative, are attracted by the protons, which are positive, and vice versa. But here in the nucleus are other particles with no electrical charge, called neutrons. Very important characters, too, as we shall see. Now, in here are two kinds of particles, protons and neutrons. No one knows what they would really look like. The protons have a positive electrical charge, like a spark. And the neutrons have no charge. They're neutral. They just hang out in the nucleus. Now, buzzing around the outside of the nucleus are very small particles called electrons. Maybe you've heard of them. It's the casual, almost conversational tone of Bill's delivery that makes his lecture inviting, and the cold, matter-of-fact demeanor of this clip that makes it unapproachable. Never, ever talk down to your audience when you're teaching them. Kids do not like being chastised, especially when they haven't done anything wrong. So don't present something you now know to be true, as if it was obvious or easy to wrap your head around the first time you heard it, regardless of whether or not that was the case. The show's philosophy is the antithesis to academic elitism. Anyone can be a scientist, the only two requirements are curiosity and motivation. Whenever Bill's in a scene with his child actor lab assistants, he's either put on equal footing with them or made the punchline of a joke, never the superior. He's here to be your tour guide into a world of science, not a patronizing gatekeeper. Now you can't have an edutainment show succeed on enthusiasm and inclusivity alone. The entertainment has to come from somewhere. That means a lot of slapstick humor, puns, weird abstract cutaway gags, puns, banter between Bill and the narrator, puns, ridiculous music video parodies, and... Oh yeah, puns. This is all dad joke level stuff, the thought-provoking content is meant to be the science, after all, but if you're open to it, it may get a laugh out of you. Pat Cashman, the narrator, who also voiced the announcer in Smash Bros. Brawl, by the way, is without a doubt the funniest part of the show. Oh, look at that. Oh, look. Look at that. Now that, right there. That is a great hole in a peanut butter jar lid yep. for a coat hanger, right mm -hmm. there. That is a great Cut. coat hanger. Secure the coat hanger with a little piece of clay. How long is this gonna go on, uh, Bo? <laughs> You're good at that. You're a little too good at that, Bill. The large majority of the child actors do a great job playing off both Bill and each other, and I'm actually glad the show casted kids who legitimately seem interested in the stuff they're teaching. You'll also occasionally notice in the later seasons the show is fully aware of its format, often cutting Bill off as a joke and acknowledging his tendency to get overly excited. And it pumps blood Cut. all through no, your no, butt. No, no, no. Bill, you gotta relax. Just calm down, oh, man, okay, let's do it again. The, weirdest dream. the editing team clearly knew how to make the best of a silly line delivery, as you'll often have scenes remixed as they're happening, reminiscent of an early predecessor to YouTube shitposting. My body produced enough heat to warm the air inside the bottle and cause the coin to jump, jump, jump. We get energy from the foods we eat. Energy is Cool. Visually, the show has a retrofuturism aesthetic going on, especially the Night Lab set, and the recycling and remixing of old archive footage is something I actually dig quite a bit. It's a nice reminder of how far we've come. The lightning fast TV static segues, colorful graphics cards, and radical 90s music cues tie together the various different segments pretty effectively given how disjointed they would seem on their own. But no proper discussion of the style of Bill Nye the Science Guy would be complete without a mention of its theme song. Bill Nye the Science Guy! Bill Nye the Science Guy! Equal parts goofy and radical, this song was written purposefully to break the mold of traditional theme songs, which you can read about in this neat interview with the original composer. It almost begs to be quoted, given the age range it was aimed for, which is a pretty genius way to self-promote, kids literally chanting the name of your show's lead. Fun fact, apparently the guys who yell Bill, Bill, Bill the whole time were actually rappers who happened to be in the studio that day. So with engaging delivery covered, it's time to move on to the academic elements. First I discussed style, now I'm exploring the substance. While writing the script, I watched approximately 35 episodes, or about a third of the entire series, with at minimum of 5 episodes from each of the 5 seasons, just to verify the quality over the course of the show's run. There's very little that noticeably changed over the course of the series, though, beyond the age of the child actors and how fancy the places they got to tour were, so I won't dwell on that point too much. Let's take another quick look at that list I made earlier. So how can I explain the four remaining items to you in the most efficient manner? This is the 
the part where I get super gross and meta on you and do it by showing you an example of a Bill Nye clip where each of the four teaching tools are all used simultaneously to deliver a fantastic opening scene on the concept of electricity. Bill starts off with a question. Anyway, what is electricity? I mean, where does it come from? Is it just sitting in the wall waiting for us to use it? Or is it constantly spilling out of sockets and we don't notice it? And how can something so powerful be invisible? There's our setup. To answer this, we have four steps. Step one, introducing some key terms. Well, electricity is the flow of tiny particles called electrons. And they're not just smaller than atoms, they're actually part of atoms. Electrons, these small charged particles that move around to make up electricity, and circuits, the closed paths that electricity flows around. Flow is another slightly less technical term introduced here that is important nonetheless because it implies movement. That's the language. Well-defined, carefully selected vocabulary to define a concept as precisely as possible using words. The difference between mass and weight may be negligible in casual conversation, but they're very different concepts in physics. Being deliberate with word choices when teaching a lesson is key to avoiding any sort of ambiguity or misunderstanding on the part of the student. The Science Guy scripts are by and large well written in this respect and make a point of defining the meaning and origin of critical terms. Step 2. Show off a concrete physical example. In this case, a small battery-powered circuit with a light bulb. Take a look at this. It's our battery-powered electrical circuit of science. We're gonna run this big light with this big battery. Watch. Attention, the Nylam shop. See, right now, electrons can flow from this side of the battery, through this wire, through the switch, through this wire, into the light, and back to this side of the battery. They're flowing in a closed path what scientists call an electrical circuit. Instantly recognizable, clear and to the point, extremely applicable. Note the use of graphics to highlight the invisible flow of electrons. Examples make up a significant portion of Bill's show. Whether it be a try this at home experiment, an interview with a seasoned professional, or even a tour of a world-class laboratory, it's critical that the viewer see these concepts in action. Maybe they'll suddenly make a logical connection because they recognize something they see in everyday life, or maybe they just don't see the relevance of a lesson until they see it being put to productive use. Sometimes it's as simple as seeing as believing, because a lot of science on paper sounds unintuitive until you realize that, no, heavier objects don't actually fall faster than lighter ones. One of the coolest parts of science is finally getting to see those equations you've been solving in action, and catapults, explosions, or even just a simple experiment involving eggs and bottle caps can really cement your understanding in ways that lines on paper can't. Next, step three. Still not sure what's going on? Do you maybe need something that's not quite an example, but a demonstration of a similar concept? Here's another type of analogous circuit, but this time with flowing water as opposed to charged particles, and your arm as the battery, or power source. When I operate this great big water pump of science, water goes through this hose into this box and makes this water wheel go around. And it goes out the other side and through this hose back to the pump. It's a closed path for the flow of water. It's a water circuit. It's just like the flow of electrons through an electrical circuit. Everyone has seen flowing water at some point in their life, making it a universally relatable analogy. Analogies are useful because they're kind of like conceptual shortcuts. Maybe you've heard that the dinosaurs are old. But just how old are they, exactly? Once you start adding more than six zeros to the end of a number, it can be pretty difficult to fully grasp how big that number actually is. It's pretty abstract. What if we could relate the age of the entire universe to the size of a football field? The entirety of human existence gets reduced down to little more than three quarters of an inch. Whereas dinosaurs came into existence at the 10 yard line and died out at the seven yard mark. A lot more impactful than just staring at numbers, huh? That's the power of analogies. You can use your understanding of a simple concept to gain a better understanding of a complex one. Analogies, whether in the form of a passing comment or an elaborate blank of science, are deftly woven into each episode. And finally, step four. Throughout this entire segment, reinforce each of these teaching tools via repetition, on-screen graphics, and by purposely varying the lecturer's tone of voice. These are all forms of emphasis. Emphasis in this context is the tool used to increase the effectiveness of a lesson by boosting the viewer's retention. The likelihood of someone remembering a concept by drawing attention to it. Listen to the way Bill speaks. Notice how his voice speeds up and down throughout a segment, speeding through the less critical parts but slowing down and settling on the important terms so you have more time to absorb them. I have a coil wire way over here and I'm making a compass needle move way over there with no apparent force. I mean, some force is going right through the air and wiggling that needle. Michael Faraday took a coil of wire and he moved it over a magnet. And when he did, electricity started to flow in this coil. The electricity went down over here to another coil and made a compass needle move. If a term is complicated enough, you'll usually see a fancy graphic pop up to spell it out, letting the viewer know that even though it's a big word, it's a big word worth remembering. And if a term is absolutely essential to understanding the concept, you can bet it's going to be repeated a few times, not just within a whole episode, but through an individual segment. Everything in the universe is either energy or matter. Matter or energy. Energy or matter. Matter or energy. Energy or what? 
or matter, or matter, 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 matter. These tools are employed in almost every non-joke scene in the show because they're universal teaching tools. But note that there's never really a perfect tool for any given situation, so the best strategy is to mix things up and employ them all as often as possible. There weren't so much techniques waiting to be invented as much as they were universal human methods of instruction that this show just happens to have mastered. And that is how you teach some science. Now the show isn't flawless by any means, I want to make that point absolutely clear. Because so far I've intentionally only been covering the elements that the show excelled in. There are three notable issues that come to mind. The most blatant of which being segments with guest stars or overly indulgent skits to make up for the lack of academic content for certain shallow subjects. A guest spot from Sinbad probably was in fact hot shit back in 93, but much less so now, and even during the 90s I don't think Al Gore was really in high demand. Secondly, there's a tendency for the show's lightning fast pace to render somewhat abstract but otherwise salvageable segments to be almost incomprehensible. I'm all for Bill turning into a rambling mess as an occasional joke, but it happened often enough where he should have been trying to stress an important point that it bugged me. Alternatively, I was half watching the episode on skin, and this trippy highway sequence popped up and ended before I even registered what was going on. Rewatching it makes it clear that it's an analogy for nerve signals racing throughout the body, but if it's so quick and abstract that I can't follow it, the intent demographic will be even more confused. My third concern is the occasional misuse of simplified language when trying to provide an entry-level explanation to a topic. As with all introductory lessons to a topic, simplifications and approximations need to be made so as not to overwhelm the student with unnecessary details. The issues with simplification that I worry about is when language or analogies are chosen without properly stressing that they are in fact simplifications, or when they are outright misleading. The episode on gravity is kind of messy in this area, where objects are described as having more or less of gravity when it's more accurate to say that they produce different gravitational field strengths. Inertia is a property of matter, not gravity. In the same episode, the distinction between mass and force, more commonly known as weight, is not made sufficiently clear either. By and large, this episode covers gravity well enough, but it cut corners where it probably shouldn't have. The episode on evolution is similarly limited, but for a different reason. It does an excellent job of stressing that the result of evolution was the creation of thousands of vastly different species by way of many small incremental mutations that just happened to occur over thousands of generations. Small changes over millions of years eventually leads to big changes overall. What the episode doesn't sufficiently explain is that these small changes are a result of the individuals in a population with the most beneficial DNA mutations having a higher chance of mating and thus reproducing. That's the lead mechanism for evolution, and it's a shame they weren't able to properly explain that just because animals banging over and over isn't really a topic that Disney is down to clown with. Kind of like how whenever the Magic School Bus explored a body and they always conveniently skipped over this part of the digestive tract. It is good to keep in mind that a PBS Kids show shouldn't be the primary resource for a classroom, and if a teacher knows how to do their job properly, they'll be able to recognize and clarify these simplifications. Now with all those issues aside, hopefully you have a better understanding of all the reasons why Bill Now the Science Guy earned all 19 of those Emmys. It's not just any kid's science show. The major theme of the final video is going to be how Bill Nye Saves the World attempts to recapture the magic of his old show by doing a fantastic job of forgetting to include even a single element that actually worked, and instead dramatically changing the format, delivery, and tone. Hey, fun fact, in show business they actually have a term for this, it's called literally everything that matters. But that's a story for another day. I need to be significantly less sober before I marathon 13 episodes of the science equivalent of a corporate Twitter account trying to shitpost.